we use Nursing Pass as our application platform. Um, and so they will actually figure GPAs for us within the system. But I have gone back and looked at many, many, many transcripts and figured GPAs on my own. And not that I don't think the elective courses and, and things like that are important, but there are a lot of basic level courses that if, if a student didn't do very well, I'm not, I'm not going to count that against them. Um, but I look at those courses in their nursing program. What were the more um, physiology and pathophysiology and pharmacology based nursing courses and how did they really do in those? Not necessarily the specific to community health or different um, patient population courses, but really the, the courses that, that dig deep into patient care across the lifespan and comorbidities and, and all of those things. I want to know how well they did in those type of courses. All right, well, welcome to today's special juicy episode. I am so excited to share this with you guys today, and I'm so excited to finally release this uh, podcast, this private CSB podcast. It has been in the works now for, gosh, we've been playing this for so it seems like probably over a year. <laughs> um, it probably really has been a year, uh, but we're finally here. Um, I'm so grateful for Dr. Wilson to be hosting this show. For those of you who have been a part of CSBA, I'm sure you're familiar with who Dr. Wilson is. He has been CSBA's expert contributor. Um, he's played a very integral part on the success of CSBA, and I'm so grateful that he has taken on this challenge to recruit faculty for you, the aspiring CRNA, and he is going to use his wisdom and skills in um, be able to bring to you questions that he knows matter to you and hear directly from a variety of CRNA faculty. And today is our founding episode, which I also want to send out a huge, huge, huge thanks to Dr. Melissa Fitch. She is the program director at the University of Evansville. She is wonderful. She's a breath of fresh air, which I know you're going to find on this episode today, but she is genuinely here to help you succeed. She wants just as badly as we do for you to find success on your CRNA journey. So she holds nothing back in today's episode. And today's sneak peek is going to be about 10 minutes of what we found to be two clips that were going to be very insightful for you. Um, if you are a CSBA student, you will have access to this entire episode, which is over 30 minutes long. Um, again, for today, uh, we're just doing a sneak peek on the regular CSB podcast. This is a private podcast exclusive for CSBA students. We will on occasion share these little clips with you here on the show because we want to make sure that we are not holding back from our avid listeners and loyal listeners, and we want to thank you for that. Um, but again, if you're a CSB student, no worries, have no fear. You're going to have the full episode at your disposal to listen to whenever you want over and over on repeat, hopefully. Um, so let's go ahead and get into what today's going to cover. I'm not going to spill the beans or the juice, but I'm going to give you some of the highlights of what we're going to uh, reveal today on this sneak peek episode. All right. So one thing that we're going to reveal today is, you know, transcripts. This is a, um, a common pain point for applicants as far as analyzing their transcripts. It can seem like kind of a, a beast, especially if you have multiple transcripts from multiple schools. Some students are have overseas transcripts, et cetera. So it can get very complex very quickly. Um, so she kind of reveals how does she look at transcripts? Um, and I, I do know they use the nursing cast. However, Almost all schools will similarly find a different way to evaluate your, your transcripts. They don't typically just take the nursing cast GPA and don't look at the rest of your transcripts or take the time to break down the different types of classes you have taken in your undergrad career. And she discusses what that looks like on her end um, and how she evaluates transcripts and tries to get a holistic picture of the student. Um, she also shares kind of some what she would consider red flags on a transcript. So this is really, really key. Um, I think hearing these red flags is going to really give you some valuable insight. Um, and also she stresses the importance of, of how to avoid these pitfalls um, going forward if you have not embarked upon improving your GPA yet. So I want to make sure you hear that chunk of the episode. All right. Next, uh, we go into, you know, what courses should a student take? This um, is a common question as far as, you know, 
what, what can I do to boost my um, chances of getting in, boost my GPA? What, what specific courses do you care the most about? And again, she kind of reveals what she finds important and then why that is. And so I think that aspect right there is really key. And then lastly, she, we kind of go over where to take these extra courses that also, also seems to be a common pain point where students are like, okay, I have an option between a 12 week course and a four week course, an online option, an in-person option. One is, you know, $3,000. One is $1,500. Can I take the the cheaper option and still have it look good towards my um, academic rigor? And this is a a common uh, position students find themselves in where they don't really know what to do or what to pick. And so again, we kind of break that down a little bit and help you understand what it is they look for when it comes to just picking any course. There are so many to pick from these days that it can be very overwhelming when you have 10 pathophysiology courses that you could take, but you don't know what college to take it from because you don't know what the school's going to look at as the most rigorous type of course versus what if you took a course at this college and they're like, well, that's really not that hard where a student took a course at this college and they're going to see, oh, well, they got a good grade at this school. I care more about this school. So she kind of shares what her thought process is as far as the selection, as far as where to take these additional courses at. So I hope you guys enjoy today's sneak peek and I appreciate you tuning into the podcast. Thank you so very much. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Another question that really came in my mind as we're sitting here talking about it is, again, getting back into the, you know, I'm an 18, 19 year old uh, individual, uh, I can actually resonate with that um, very well mm-hmm. with the fact of how I did in my first year of my undergrad degree is when you're looking at transcripts and, you know, all these programs have the transcripts are either unofficial or official sent to them. Um, what are some of the first things you look at on the transcript? Obviously, the GPA, overall GPA is one of the first, but what are some of the other little particulars that you like to have or like to look for within the transcripts you know we use nursing cast as as our application platform um and so they will actually figure gpas for us within the system but i have gone back and looked at many 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 transcripts and figured gpas on my own and not that i don't think the um you know elective courses and and things like that are important but you know there there are a lot of basic level courses that if if a student didn't do very well, I'm not, I'm not going to count that against them. Um, but I look at those, you know, courses in their, in their nursing program, what were the more um, physiology and pathophysiology and pharmacology based nursing courses and how did they really do in those? Um, not necessarily the um, like specific to community health or different um, patient population courses, but really the the courses that that dig deep into um, patient care across the lifespan and comorbidities and 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 all of those things. I want to know how how well they did in those type of courses. Um, and then again, at, at the, the science-based courses like stats and chemistry. And of course, we don't require A&P as, as a prereq, but, you know, I'm kind of old school and I like to know how they do it in their, in their A&P class, because obviously there's going to be a lot of anatomy and physiology involved in, in anesthesia school. So I do, I do look back at those. I also kind of focus on if someone had to take um, basic chemistry or even A&P three or four times to yep. get above a C, um, that that's a red flag for me. That just shows me that they really struggle in that area. And sometimes they they took it a couple of times, you know, when they were younger, and then they they tried again, um, you know, as they got in mid to late twenties, and still just weren't overly successful. So that that does tend to be tend to be a little bit of a red flag for me if if they've had to take it three or four times. Yeah. So, and one last question I've got for you, at least on the academics and talking about the uh, academics, transcripts and GPA type um, part of the application is another, the real big question we get a a number of times is where do I take an advanced course from? Mm -hmm. Um, There's plenty of programs out there. Obviously there's Doane, UNE, Mm -hmm. uh, Phoenix, Chamberlain. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's the brick and mortar four-year institutions that you can take them from. Um, so really, you know, when you look at, I'm going to take another course, whether it's an advanced level or a graduate level, you know, what are your thoughts and what do you think about those different types of places and what do you look for 
if somebody goes to take an advanced science course in relationship to where they're taking it? Um, that's a question we get a lot too. And, and they'll always ask me, will you accept it from, you know, Phoenix online or, or, you know, whatever, whatever type of, of, of institution. I always ask them to send me the course description um, and I kind of compare it to what we do here um, because they can't, I mean, I guess they could come in and try to take some, some grad level courses here. It's just going to be a lot more expensive if they're doing that prior to admission. Um, but I always ask them to send me the course description and I try to compare if it looks like it's you know, simply just going to be too basic um, or just kind of a, a filler course, a, a rush through, um, get this done in four weeks just so you can meet a requirement, but they're really not mm -hmm. going to learn anything from it. Yeah. I try to steer them in a different direction. Well, hello, future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration along your CRNA journey. This success story from our student starts as follows. I had my first ever interview yesterday afternoon and received a call this morning that I have been accepted into my top choice program. I'm still in shock and so excited. I didn't think this would ever be possible this year since I hadn't been able to get any interviews at the other two schools I had applied to, but I kept studying and I kept praying. The timing was perfect and it happened exactly how it was supposed to. I'm so grateful for this community, the support and encouragement from everyone. The hard work that Jenny, Richard, and Don have put into this has been life-changing for me. Huge thank you to Haley Frank for a wonderful mock interview back in October. 100% recommend. The five-day interview prep was so helpful as well as all the other resources. I watched all the mock interviews as well. For those that compare yourself to others just like I did, just know that everyone has a different path. I have three years of CVICU experience, a CCRN, CSC, GRE of 302, a cumulative GPA of a 3.2. The last 60 credits though was of GPA was a 3.7 and a science GPA of a 3.5. I really believe the interview is what pushed me to the top because I was able to answer questions precisely, show my personality and my clinical knowledge. Keep pushing forward because if you can, if I can do this, so can you. So I love this story because maybe they were having doubts about their overall GPA being closer to 3.2. Um, but what I want to point out here is that they broke down their GPA between what was the last 60 credit hour GPA as well as the science GPA and overall. So know that your GPA is not just one number. It has multiple moving parts to it. So you have to really know them all in order to make better decisions about how to move forward. Um, I also love the fact that, you know, they seemed like they were facing a lot of fear and a lot of doubt whether this was going to be possible for them, but the timing just worked and they never would have experienced the success had they not tried. They applied and they got in. So for those of you who are questioning whether to wait a year, just apply and see what happens. Now, I will also caution you to make sure that you know if your school has an application limit. Um, some schools only allow you to apply once or twice or maybe three times. So make sure you know that prior to just winging it. I'm not saying to just wing it and get one in just to get it in. But I do think if you start the process of trying to apply to CRNA school and getting the feedback on how to move forward if you're not selected is really the quickest way to gain acceptance to CRNA schools. So just start putting yourself out there um, and then take the feedback. So I hope you guys enjoyed this inspirational story. Congratulations. You know who you are. And I'm so excited for you. I'm rooting for you all the way through. Now back to the show. Yeah, and that's a great point because there are a lot of universities out there that are really about the quality of the education that they're providing um, to these individuals taking it. And then there's a number that are really about the quantity of people they're bringing in to help with, you know, some of the dollars that they need for the university. So, you know, really guiding it and looking at it because not every 12 week and not every four week course is going to be the same um, and being able um, to do that. And one thing I always tell when we're talking about taking these courses, uh, and I think you would agree with this, is I always tell people when you're going to take additional courses, really think about the timing of it. In other words, if you're going to take a, an advanced pathophysiology course and you are struggling with pathophys in the units and you struggled a little bit with it in the, in the past in your other degree, you know, don't do that at a time where you know you're about to hit a really big kind of busy time in your life that you can't really dedicate and focus on the course in itself because an okay to a poor grade 
is going to do you a whole lot more harm than having not taken it at all possibly. Right, right, right. Because you don't want to, you don't want to add further, further damage to your GPA if your goal is to try to, to bring that up and make yourself a stronger candidate. So yeah, you've got to make sure that you're at a place where you're ready to take it and you're ready to focus on it. And this is a question we get on our blogs and in our social media posts all the time is what courses should I take? for getting into nurse anesthesia school because a lot of them like I said who have maybe a 3.2 3.1 GPA and they're trying to build that up to a nice standard um, or if they are saying that they struggled in some courses in anesthesia or in nursing school they're always asking so I'm just kind of curious and across the nation uh, what are the thoughts of the courses that are great to take to prepare you for anesthesia school? I think we've had several that have gone and taken some grad level pathophysiology courses. And, and I really like that because one of the things that I tell applicants when they, when they are, you know, calling or emailing and they want to know what is going to make me a stronger candidate, or even after they get accepted and they say, what can I do between now and the day I start? Pathophysiology is one of the things that I really focus on. And I tell them, take the sickest patients in the ICU ask the questions when the hospitalist and, and practitioners are coming in and they're writing orders and they're, they're starting treatments, ask why. And so, um, you know, I think we come into anesthesia school at the top of our game as really strong ICU nurses and, and we know what we need to know at that level, but then we start anesthesia school and it's a whole new level. We may have been giving these medications and following these orders for a long time, but not really digging deep into the why and, and, you know, how these treatments and medications work. So I, I always like it when I have students that, you know, that have taken it upon themselves to maybe take like a grad level, you know, pathophys class um, in order to prep for school and, and to bring their GPA up, you know, to, to even a, a bit of a higher level. I just think it shows a lot of initiative um, and forward thinking um, in, in preparing for coming to anesthesia school. Yeah, and I know a lot of these programs now, and it's interesting to see some of the shifts that we're seeing within the universities, is those grad level courses are not being offered um, as frequently because of a number of people taking them, obviously, and they're trying to hold them all for uh, degree seeking individuals. And so, you know, we always talk also about those advanced courses, which may not be graduate level, but just the higher advanced. So, uh, you know, I think that's a great idea. I think you're, you're right with the pathophysiology side of it. It is huge. Huge, obviously. And I also heard you mention the pharmacology side of it. So um, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on the pharmacology and taking pharmacology, maybe even advanced pharm courses before they come in. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I will tell you for our program specifically, when our students begin their first semester, they have anatomy and they have a basic pharm class. And those are both taught along I think I mentioned before with the physician assistant program. So one of our faculty members, actually the chair of the PA program is a pharmacist by trade. And so he teaches their advanced farm class. So for us specifically, they get a really, really good comprehensive basic farm class before they get to our advanced farm class that we teach within the program. So I feel really comfortable with that. Now, I feel like if if a program maybe doesn't have a good base level farm class, um, encouraging a student to to take um, kind of kind of a, a a good comprehensive pharmacology class to to as a as a as a review as a reminder, you know, just to kind of um, get that good base before they start is not a bad idea. Wonderful. All right. Well, that sums up today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys found that so valuable. And I look forward to, again, sharing some more uh, golden nuggets with you guys in the future. Um, again, if you're a CSBA member, there will be an entire section inside the academy that's labeled Nurse Anesthesia Educators Unplugged Podcast. It will be um, inside the membership. So again, you log into your membership to have access to this. Again, you can play this on audio. Um, whenever you are driving or cooking or folding laundry, whatever, whatever fits your learning style. Again, we hope you guys find a lot of value in these episodes and we're excited for future episodes to share with you. And until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you 
um, please be sure to share um, that if CSB podcast has been helpful for you in your journey journey, I would so very much appreciate it if you were able to share um, this valuable uh, podcast with others that you know who are embarking on their CRNA journey. I call it pain it forward. So again, if this has been a valuable resource for you, a valuable tool on your own CRNA journey, I would so greatly appreciate it if you were able to share it with someone else down the, down the road, even if you don't know anyone right now, um, keep us in mind to make sure you send people our way, because again, we want to help you find success. We want to help your, your peers find success. So cheers to your future and thank you so much. And until next time, take care. Hey, future CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.